but it's now turned from legal issues to something completely different. The commercial consequences of the canal blockage. Did companies reroute ships around Africa to avoid the blockage? What happened at major European ports when suddenly large container ships stopped showing up and then after the grounding was cleared, too many of them showed up at once? Are there lessons to be learned from the six day blockage of the Suez Canal or have supply chain managers simply gone back to business as usual? For answers to these and other questions, we turn to our final speaker, Brian Nimeth, is a director at Alex Partners, a management and economics consulting firm headquartered in New York with offices around the world. Brian has more than 19 years of experience in the shipping, freight forwarding, and third-party logistics industries. In addition to international transportation expertise, Brian has had extensive general supply chain experience in a variety of industry sectors. Prior to joining Alex Partners, Brian, who holds an MBA from New York University, held various positions in the US and Asia with the AP Muller Maersk Group. Brian, you have the floor. Now I know that you might be a little pinched on time. Um, I think the remedy for that is to just keep going at 12.30 if uh, Dave Gardy can uh, Accommodate us. If there are people who have to sign off among the viewers, uh, obviously they're free to do so, but I think you should keep going and try to cover as much of your material as possible. Great. Thanks, Keith. So yeah, I'm going to try to uh, to keep it within 20 minutes here, walking you guys through the impact uh, on international trade and sup uh, potential supply chain changes that are in the process of occurring or that are strategically being looked at to, uh, to modify, to take into account disruptions in general, but specifically related to the ever given grounding. So as Keith mentioned, I just want to highlight two things, right? I worked at Maersk for the first 10 years of my career, both in the logistics group and the container shipping group. Um, I did that in Asia and in the United States. And since my time at Alex Partners, I spent about half my time working with shipping companies and transportation companies in general, and the other half with shippers or importers. So I think I'm gonna bring good perspectives from both sides of, of that coin here today, right? What is a transportation company doing in this situation and what are the shippers and importers doing? So what I'm gonna walk you through, I'll do uh, very briefly the timeline of events. I think Jim did a great job on his presentation. So that's an area I'll be able to, uh, to speed up on. Uh, I'll talk about all the stakeholders in specifically the container shipping value chain. I think it's important to level set who is being impacted upstream and downstream. So I'll do a quick overview of that and then talk about the impact of, of the grounding, um, the actions that the container shipping companies took during the events or just shipping companies in general, upstream and downstream effects. I'll focus specifically on the container shipping companies and then how are shippers responding. So the timeline here, right, is it was 11 days from when the vessel uh, got stuck in the Suez Canal to basically operations were back up and running and normal. I'm not gonna spend much time in this, Jim. I think you did a great job walking us through through the timelines here and, and what needed to be done. But again, when you think about it, right, a layman looks at this and goes, it's only 11 days. Uh, you know, how much impact is this really gonna have on international trade? And here we are three months later, and, and I'm gonna highlight for you, it's still having a very extreme impact on international trade. And, and so, as experts in this area, we all knew this would be the case, but the layman reading the New York Times and the Wall Street Journal that knows nothing about transportation is, you know, initially is like, hey, how is this that big of a deal now that the vessel, you know, was freed? And then all the other vessels were able to, to pilot or work their way through the through the canal. So when we look at the, the critical stakeholders in the value chain, I've broken it up in these three areas, the origin related activities, kind of the ocean or the transport activities and the destination activities. And I think it's really important that we we are grounded with all the stakeholders here. When when I talk about some of the impacts here, a lot of them were obviously initiated by COVID-19. But I think you have this multiplier effect that's occurred with these disruptions. You have obviously the ever given grounding and then you're also going to have the impact now of the shutdown or the slowdown at the Yantian port due to the COVID breakout. And so all these disruptions are further exasperating basically international trade and international supply chains. So 
when we look at these activities, factories have been challenged, right? The factories are challenged in getting raw material in, you know, the, the container shipping um, network is very intertwined and um, the strings are running on almost, you know, I, for a lay person, I say it's like a bus schedule, right? And, and a disruption like this impacts not only the direct shipments from Asia to Europe, but it also impacts the full, uh, the full string of that, that vessel. So raw materials coming into factories are impacting delays in manufacturing. Equipment has been a really large area of concern also. Equipment is in the wrong places. Um, you know, the, the, the global supply chain is kind of, like, kind of like a finely tuned machine. And then, you know, you, you took COVID, then you took the ever given grounding and basically disrupted this whole process. And so you have containers that are just in the wrong place. A few months ago, it was extremely difficult to get containers in Ningbo and Shanghai and Yantian and Jakarta. Um, and you had importers that were typically shipping 40 foot containers, desperately getting their hands on 20 foot, whatever they could get their hands on. Um, so you, you started to see there container terminals on the origin side. Um, you've seen issues with COVID outbreaks. Like I said, the Yantian element that I'm gonna talk about on the container shipping companies, they were already struggling with ske schedule reliability and service levels, and this just further exasperated it, right? And and this hit more regionally, right? Asia to, to Europe was the hardest hit, but Asia to the east coast of the U.S. imports, those were the areas that were, that were hit uh, extensively. Also, the canal authorities, right? In this case, the Suez Canal, the, there's six days of transit that they're not going to get those tolls for, right? They can't get those days back. Volume still going to move through, but there was loss obviously around revenue for them. And then freight forwarders actually took an interesting role here, right? They buy and sell space on the asset owning container ship operators, and they were able to provide valves for uh, importers and shippers, basically offering air freight and, and additional services on the origin and destination side. On the destination side, we saw what we're seeing right now in Europe is is heavy congestion in the northern European continental ports. And this is, a you know, I believe a direct result of the ever given grounding. COVID already had already impacted some of this. Um, you can see that in the U.S. You had, I think, as many as 40 vessels at outer anchorage at one point in Southern California. That, that number's dropped considerably. But now what you're seeing is congestion in northern Europe. You're seeing uh, uh, container operators skipping those terminals. You have trucking and, uh, and, and drayage operator shortages. Um, this is happening in, in Europe and in the US. Uh, with the COVID outbreaks, you don't have as many, many resources and labor. And then you have the containers basically stockpiling at these congested ports and they're not being able to be moved. And then you get the equipment on the backside. Equipment's not available at the right places. The shippers are not able to load containers, re-export out, and, and the empty containers are not at the origin to fill. And it's and it's it's creating chaos. The last piece is the shippers and importers warehouses. So this has kind of been a little bit overlooked, but again, the labor shortages. Usually, the 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 container comes off the vessel. If you're not incurring demurrage, you know, within a few days, the container goes to the warehouse, gets unloaded, and then kind of continues its cycle. What we're seeing now is labor shortages are are creating dwell times at container yards that are three or four times what they are at normal. Again, driving um exasperation in the, in the whole entire supply chain piece and what all these things lead to is the end customer consumer us as as consumers are, get, are heavily going to be uh, impacted by this right there's availability of products on shelves there's availability of automobiles all the different things that are occurring increased cost inflation has obviously been uh, high in the news on the u.s side uh, i'm going to touch on the increased cost impact but this is where we're all seeing it. This is what um, shippers and importers are doing their best to do is try to control, but product availability and product costs are, are severely impacted by, by a disruption such as the, uh, the ever given grounding. So what was the impact of the grounding? So at the time of the incident, they estimated, Lloyd's List estimated the blockage was about $10 billion per day worth of goods. So what was it, 60 billion for the, for the six days? A lot of that product was just delayed, right? There are some perishable products that, you know, there are some loss, but for the most part, the product was still able to get to the, um, get to the final location over time. 
Um, I'm not going to touch on the ever given uh, cargo itself. I think Nick and Wayne, you guys also, you did a great job on that about the value, what the impacts are specifically on that. But what's more important is we're three months on and the ripple effects being felt today are really extreme. Container rates right now are at record highs and especially from Asia to Europe. And this is a direct result, right? We're, we're seeing rates I've heard as high as $20,000 a container going from Asia to, to Northern Europe. Um, and if you look at probably a year, year and a half ago, you were talking about $1,000 to $2,000 a container. So that is a huge difference. We're talking about record highs on, on container rates. And this is a global phenomenon. Um, and so that is being experienced now. And, and shippers and importers are trying to figure out how they absorb that cost. And that cost eventually is going to come to us as consumers. The other area I touched on with the stakeholders, port congestion the last couple of weeks, I think calls to Rotterdam, Bremerhaven, uh, Hamburg, uh, container shipping lines are starting to cut some of those ports of calls due to congestion and skipping. Um, and also with inland moves, containers are not in the right locations and there's also creating bottlenecks. And again, these, uh, in, uh, in my opinion, are a direct result of, of the grounding, not, you know, that go above and beyond the, um, the COVID impacts. The other interesting aspect is schedule reliability was abysmal as an understatement. If you look at the bottom left chart, uh, if you guys can see that, it just tanked in July of 2020 and went down considerably, right? They were, the ocean liners were basically floating in the 60 to 80% range and it dropped to, you know, below 50% and below 40%. They started to see a little bit of a bump in February to March. Like I said, some of the vessel delays in, in the U.S. started to see ro some relief. Then you have the grounding in April. You're starting to see a dip again. So I think, again, another large impact for international trade is less reliability and longer lead times. And that's going to lead to shippers and importers having to make important and strategic decisions about how they handle um, their imports. I will touch on that one later. So what actions did container shipping companies take during the, the grounding? So um, there were 350 plus ships. I think, Nick, you actually mentioned 400 ships were basically delayed, right, uh, as a result of this. The alternate route is around the Cape, uh, Cape of Good Hope. Here's a good example that I was able to pull. Basically, you're talking about 10 days additional uh, for this Taiwan, Kaohsiung to Rotterdam um, route. And so... 10 days again might not seem like a lot, but when you think about the operating cost and, and, and you think of it from a string perspective, you need to put one or two additional container vessels in order to be able to operate that on a weekly schedule to be able to go around. And what we saw actually occur was, I would say dozens of vessels, I couldn't get an exact number, but dozens of vessels was, was the kind of the consensus I was able to obtain chose to go around Cape of Good Hope and chose certainty over, over kind of waiting out how long it was going to take the Ever Given to be released. In addition, I know some, some vessels started that route and quickly turned around once the high tide and everything was able to, uh, to, uh, to take advantage of that. But I think long term, uh, you know, there is a, a big supply issue on the container shipping perspective. And it, I don't see it feasible adding one or two vessels to, to maintain uh, a string that goes around the Cape of Good Hope over the longer term. So upstream and downstream effects. I, I spoke a little bit about this. There's a lot of different areas that are impacted, right? The factories, the container terminal congestion, equipment, uh, product delays. I wanted to focus on one thing in, in particular, and that is what are the container shipping companies able to do? Um, and this is a, a little um, snippet from a, the our annual container uh, a container uh, industry study. And what you could see here is over the last 10 years, the container ship companies had, had severely limited their new builds. Um, so basically the container shipping tonnage was extremely limited and, you know, and, and historically there was always oversupply. What happened was in COVID you had this huge boost of demand and very little supply. Supply demand was kind of an equilibrium for the container ships. And so what you're seeing now is with all this demand for the extra vessels to be able to handle all the disruption that's occurring, 
is all the uh, all the players are, are putting new orders in. And the order books are full all the way out to 2024 now. But a container ship isn't built overnight. And so what that means is it's going to take a while for the for the asset owners and the operators to work their way through this, to get the supply back on, to try to bring things back to normal. Um, and so, uh, you know, the rest of this year, probably going into 2022, maybe maybe all of 2022, depending on what demand looks like, we can continue to see these these disruptions related to container shipping due to lack of supply. In addition to the vessels themselves, there's there's big investment in equipment, buying more, and purchasing more actual containers themselves, shipping containers, in order to make sure that um, there's enough uh, enough pro enough uh, equipment to be able to move the freight, and that equipment is in the right place. So, how are shippers or importers responding? This has been, uh, you know, this is some of the busiest I've personally ever been with my area of expertise, and I wanted to highlight a few. A few elements. There's a lot more to this. Again, given the timing, I wanted to highlight like the broad strokes, which we're seeing kind of consistent themes. One of them is visibility. So this has created awareness in a lot of companies of the lack of visibility that they have from when the product basically leaves the factory until it arrives in their distribution center. Um, some companies do have do have it, but a lot of companies and a lot of large companies realize that this is a large gap for them. So they knew there were delays but they were not able to communicate into their organizations very well what's delayed, how long it's delayed, and where it is in the inbound process. So there's been a lot of requests for us to work with companies to be able to identify solutions here, including requests for information and requests for pricing to ramp up solutions purely to allow better planning and communication internally. The second is product segmentation. So knowing that freight is so expensive knowing how hard it is to get space we, we've seen is customers have been trying to identify ways to identify what products are more important to get in and what should they prioritize and what we've seen is uh you know we have customers that are wholesalers and retailers they have large you know large retailers in the us and europe have very strict penalties if you don't deliver on time and so there's prioritization on how do I get my product in? Do I air freight it? Do I continue to move down ocean shipping? There's high margin, um, high value, perishable. These are the different segmentation areas that, that, that they're focused on and working um, on trying to basically prioritize and guarantee space on vessels and try and understand that trade-off, right? Is it worth $20,000 instead of 2000 to bring this cargo in? Um, if you're shipping a product that, you know, is only you know, cost the dollar per unit and you're making, you know, 10 cents, $20,000 container from a $2,000 container is going to have a big impact on your, on your profitability. But if you're shipping a extremely high value product, it might be mean nothing to you. The other area we're seeing, which starts to be a little bit more longer term is inventory strategies, right? The, the trend from business has been reducing working capital and, and, and trying to slim down inventories. Uh, it depends on industry, but in general, what we're also seeing is, is is importers are buying what they can, and we're seeing larger orders being made, and there might be long-term plays to, through that product segmentation, decide how much inventory you should keep and where you should keep that inventory. And the other area is sourcing strategy. So a lot of exposure that exists here is was from the Asia to Europe, Asia to the U.S. Um, uh, trades. And so a conversation that often comes up is near shoring and local manufacturing, right? And if you're in North America or the U.S., do you, do you bring, fact, uh, bring production to the U.S. or do you use Mexico? If you're in Europe, do you leverage Eastern Europe? So these types of questions are popping up again, and, and customers are looking at this and taking it very seriously. And then just general other measures, I think one of the most interesting ones that was in the news just a few weeks ago is one of the largest retailers in the U.S. basically secured their own vessel. Um, they, you know, the lack of control and the dependency on the different container operators led them to basically, I don't know if they chartered it exactly, I don't know the, the, the direct details of the, of, the, uh, of the agreement, but basically there's going to be one vessel that's probably coming from Asia to the U.S. that is purely one large retailer. So people are getting creative with, with solutions to try to get control of their supply chains. 
So to summarize here, I think the big takeaway is the Ever Given is, is one of many disruptions. And I think these disruptions to international trade are, are here to stay. They're having, they're occurring at a more frequent pace and they're hard to predict. And, you know, I highlighted a few here, right? The tariffs started it. COVID-19 obviously really, uh, really changed the game. And then the Ever Given grounding was a huge disruption. And now the support of the Antien outbreak, I think if you look the, the the port I think is up and up and operating back to normal this week or last week. If you look at shipments to the U.S. and Europe, you're saying 30 days, 14 to 30 days from now, all those shipments are going to start to arrive, and you're going to have even more congestion, another bottleneck release, a lot of product arriving at these ports that are going to put a lot of pressure on the container shipping space and the whole entire transportation value chain. So understanding disruption risk for your particular business is the very is the first step to identify the strategy, right? Strategies are going to be different depending on your industry, depending on where you are in the value chain and what needs to be to be done. And I highlighted what a few people or a few of the players are doing. The container lines are ordering a lot more vessels and they're ordering equipment, but this is not going to be an immediate uh, lever of relief. Container terminals, drage and trucking operators. I can tell you in the U.S., I'm actually my current client right now is a drainage operator. They're looking for ways to improve efficiency through technology to, to help with the log jams, help to create relief in order to help product flow more quickly. And the shipper strategies we just spoke about, right? I think the big ones that are going to stay around a little bit longer are, are this inventory and the, and the supply base diversification. Um, but those two will they'll impact you know, the demand profile. If you take 10% of product you're currently sourcing in Asia and you move that to Mexico and in Eastern Europe, you basically are taking that demand out of the out of those those strings and those strings that you know go through the Suez Canal. So over, you know, when we look at this short-term, long-term strategies that provide flexibility are going to be critical, critical. And you know, there's going to be a lot of disruption. And the people who are going to win are the ones that have thought through this and, and what options they have and, and how they're going to handle that. So with that, I think I'm a little bit above uh, the, the, the timeline here, but uh, I'm open to any questions or pass it back to you, Keith, and I appreciate the opportunity to talk here. Thanks, Brian. Thanks very much. I, I 